know there are issues. There's too much poverty, there are housing issues, there are public safety issues, there are education issues. None of those issues get addressed if your intent is to inflict property or personal damage in this great neighborhood. The fact that you've got some angry people who want to cause problems is something that we will not tolerate. We've been here before. A police officer shoots a suspect in part of a town that has been on edge for some time. The neighborhood explodes. Buildings are torched. Businesses are destroyed. The very people who have sought to make the area a better place to live are now the ones digging out from under a level of crime they not only didn't bring on themselves, but certainly didn't deserve. A knee-jerk reaction to a situation that has far too often become the norm across America, where it would seem that no matter what law enforcement does, no matter how proper they would seem to be in comporting themselves daily, and no matter, there would not seem to be a racial element with the initial evidence in this case in Milwaukee pointing to what cops would call a good shoot. Questions remain. And once again, people want to know what is being done to keep neighborhoods from blowing up in nights and days of violence and additional crime. There's no easy answer. Your calls and comments are always encouraged. What would you suggest be done next to avoid another situation as to the one that occurred in Milwaukee? Hit the buttons. 1-877-NEWSMAX, 1-877-639-7629. Our guest is considered an expert on law enforcement, data, technology, and information security. CEO and founder of Street Cred Software, and one who follows the big picture of law enforcement technology. Also author of In Context, Understanding Police Killings of Unarmed Civilians. Welcome Nick Selby to the hard line. Nick, thanks for joining us. We do want to point out that this was not an unarmed civilian that was involved here. This was a guy with a long record dating back to at least 2011. He had tried to intimidate witnesses. He had a loaded weapon with more than 20 rounds in his possession, and that weapon was stolen, and he ran from cops on a traffic stop and also did not drop the weapon when he was told to. This seems cut and dried, to be quite frank. But what is it? That, are we missing anything here? Because I've been involved in situations in South Florida and other cities where I've covered them, where neighborhoods have blown up when there have been these types of shootings, yet people still want to loot and they want to become, quite frankly, nothing more than common thugs. What are we missing in trying to stop this? I think that you've actually hit it right on the spot. There's, there's really nothing. What we had is somebody who was actually being a danger to the community uh, and to others. He was, as you say, he was armed. He was actually armed with a stolen gun um, that he had stolen back in March, uh, along with 500 rounds of ammunition. Uh, there are some questions about the, uh, why the traffic stop happened. I still don't know what the probable cause was that the officer had to make the stop or what made the officer suspect uh, that, that Mr. Smith was armed. But I do think that uh, it was a good stop. Uh, it was obviously uh, a chase where the uh, Ed Flynn, and that sounded like Ed Flynn speaking, uh, was saying that the officer had given him warnings that they have it on video and that, that this seemed actually very, very straightforward. What uh, followed was, I think, a, uh, a reaction that has been the, the kind of reaction that we've been seeing across the country to feelings that the African-American community is being mistreated actually turned a little bit on its ear and just actually using the excuse to to get very upset because any force at all was used on, on an African-American man, despite the fact that the officer himself was African-American, uh, despite the fact that the guy was armed. It really does make no sense if they're trying to ask for something because right Let, now what they're doing is simply rioting. Let's talk about technology here as well because that's right in your wheelhouse. The mayor of Milwaukee, Tom Barrett, has asked about the body camera the officer was wearing. Now, I've already heard several people, and I quite frankly know a little bit about the technology, so we'll talk about this on the other side of the soundbite, but many people are saying, you need to release that right away. You need to get that video out there right away, and you need people to see it. Now, first, here's how the mayor addressed that concern. Um, I have not seen the video. There was a body camera that the officer was wearing. Um, that video will be under the jurisdiction for the time being of the state of Wisconsin because the state of Wisconsin will be conducting the investigation. Let's get to what he said first of all. Two things here. First of all, he said it's under the state of Wisconsin now. It's under their jurisdiction. Is it not fair to say that those who are calling for something like this to be released immediately, quite frankly, have no clue what they're talking about because you have a chain of command. You also have a chain of evidence that has to be looked at in context the title of your book as well is well placed here. But if you don't do that, then you take the opportunity of creating another situation where there's a complete knee jerk. 
there is that danger. Um, I will say that uh, what the mayor is referring to is the fact that the Wisconsin state law actually asks for um, any time there's an officer involved killing that somebody from another agency is looking at it at least one. Um, and in this case, Milwaukee's asked uh, the state investigators to come in. And I think that that's a really good move to show that um, there will be a, a just and fair investigation. I am actually on the side of people who say that the video should be released. And I'll tell you why. Uh, last okay. year in 2015, there was only video in about 25% of the officer involved deaths. And that tells you that 75% of the agencies are not uh, in, in some ways using video. We've also seen that the only times that there were indictments of officers last year for bad behavior, and there were a couple of incidents last year in which there were officers behaving badly, there was video in those cases. Um, I don't think that it is unreasonable to ask to see the video if the, uh, if the police department is saying that it exonerates the officer. But is it, but I, I got to interrupt here, though. Is it sure. not fair to say, though, that if you do, if you take that video, if it happens at night and you have the next day that comes up and you're taking that video out, you need to be able to show it. You're going to show it unedited, which is what people want, which could be, quite frankly, shocking for some people to see. But you've got to have somebody there to put it in context. You do. Because if you and just show it, then there's going to be people out there saying, oh, the cop obviously went out there to look out and see if he could kill somebody. But you need to have somebody there to put it in the context of what actually happened, or else you're just showing video that could be anything anywhere. Yes, and that's why it's important that they also release the context. The people who are very good at this is Las Vegas, Nevada. Within 48 hours of an officer-involved shooting, Las Vegas will come out with everything they have, including video and context. And so that would be explained at that point. What we have found in our research around the country is that when law enforcement agencies do this and they come forth with the information, everything from radio uh, transcripts and radio recordings to 911 call transcripts and recordings to officer body worn and dash cam video, they actually build tremendous trust with their community. And then we find that the community will actually accept certain things like, well, we're not able to give you this yet, but give us another day. The community tolerates that more because they feel that the police are being uh, honest with them and transparent. In this country, transparency and sunlight is really the cure for most things. And in this case, I would say, since there's such public interest in it already, we, we believe, my co-authors and I believe, that releasing the video along with that contextual information you mentioned, which is so important, uh, is something that can only help. Now, I do understand there are technical issues with the, idio, uh, with the video, that the audio was actually out of sync with the video. That's fine. People understand that technology is not perfect. But when we hold on to something that we're saying is uh, demonstrative of the officer's good acts here, it, it is really bad if you don't actually release it and let the public judge for, for itself. Let me get a viewer call in here. Frank is in Forest Park, Georgia. Frank, thanks for joining us. Let me ask you a simple question, Frank. Do you believe that videotape, once it's taken, it's on the cop's body, it comes from that body cam, that it's got to be out within 24 hours as soon as possible with context? Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. I would, I would, I would also, you know, okay, Frank. We cannot understand a word you're saying. We apologize, but it almost sounds like an echo chamber. And again, I don't want you to be misunderstood. Short time that we have left here. Let's go ahead and talk about this, Nick. Money. The Chattanooga Police Department is asking their city for emergency funding for upgrades because of violence against cops. We have law enforcement agencies across America that are desperate to find enough money here to get these body cams and make sure they work properly. Isn't it fair to say that we're looking at a time because of citizens, because of shootings, because of media attention, that the money has got some way, one way or another, you've got to find the money to put that technology on the body of the cops to protect the cops, the victims, and the citizenry. I agree 100%. Um, the, other, the other hidden cost here is it's not just the, the, the body cams themselves, but it's also the training in their use, the training in policy creation, which is probably the most important single issue, creating the policy of when cameras are used and when they are not. But the single most expensive continuing expense is the uh, transfer to a cloud storage or transfer to storage facilities, and then it's maintenance and the, the ability to index that data, store it in a secure environment so that we can can get to it and understand that it has not been tampered with. All of this costs a lot more money than uh, so far President Obama's uh, administration has offered a very, very unacceptable, I think it was $65 million, which doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the money required for these cameras uh, and their constant upkeep. And we'll see these costs go up 
because the, the public is rightfully asking for more information about the police who, who protect them. And that just means that we'll need more technology like uh, body worn videos. And we'll also have to come up with different policies around who gets to see the information when and where the conversation that we're having now. It's a hugely important conversation that has really, really barely begun in this country. And it's a conversation that needs to begin. And I'm sure that Nick, you would agree with me as well, that if the conversation begins now, we're still looking at something that is going to take weeks, months, years before we get to a point where it is going to be to where you get it, it happens, you take the video, and you explain it to people, but it's just not going to be that quick, not that fast. The book Absolutely again, right. The book, again, once again, is called In Context, which is what we like to put things in here on this show, Understanding Police Killings of Unarmed Civilians. Nick Selby, a pleasure, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm sure we're going to do it again. Thank you. Thanks. Up next, one man has the best advice a next president could receive about fighting ISIS. But would Donald or Hillary actually listen? I want you to listen to me and remember that on Direct TV, Newsmax is now on channel 366. Don't go anyplace else. Go to JLTV on channel 366. That's where you'll find us. And you'll find us when we come back after this.